You're listening to the Visual Vocalist Podcast. I'm your host, Eli Prinson. Join me and let's explore all things vocal, including technique, mindset, training and performance in an effort to unleash your full vocal potential. All right, welcome to the Visual Vocalist Podcast. I'm your host, Eli Prinson. Thanks for joining. All right, in this uh, seventh episode, episode seven, lucky number seven, we're going to talk about live singing versus studio singing, okay? So some of you right away will probably have echoes of of, uh, other vocal coaches saying, well, the technique is the same no matter where you are, if it's in the studio or on stage, blah, 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 okay, or something (laughs) <laughs> much more complicated and extensive than that. Um, but I completely disagree, okay? Now, I do agree that, yes, you have to have good technique. You have to study good technique, or you're lucky if you find good technique out there, okay? Study it and translate that technique to actual singing so that you're not one of these people that gets stuck (laughs) being able to do mum, 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 mum throughout uh, the entire keyboard and then can't sing through a song, all right? So make sure that your technique translates to actual singing, all right, first and foremost. Now, live singing versus studio singing. The reason that I'm saying they're different, I want to explain myself, okay? Um, First of all, Comping, okay? Are you going to sing one take on every track that you do in the studio? Is that what you're going to do? Are you going to sing one take of the song? You're going to nail it. It's going to be perfect. You're going to print it. You're going to send it out there. It's permanent. I think not. No, it's not the way it's done, okay? And even in today's uh, studios, which are usually out of people's homes. Producers um, work out of their homes. A lot of bands are highly skilled at that nowadays, okay? It's not like it used to be where you'd have to book time um, for the most part. Uh, back in the old analog days, book a, book a segment of time and you got only a certain amount of time to work with things and you're trying to get things perfect, right? And most people, I'd say 99.999% of singers do not nail the perfect final printed vocal on their first take. Now, it has happened. There are uh, instances out there, some, um, some famous vocals that came out in one take, and that's awesome. That's wonderful, okay? But what I'm about to talk about is comping, all right? Comping. All that means is... Um, I've, I've worked with some producers that said, okay, I want you to go ahead and sing through the entire song and then we'll go back and then I'll, you know, he would tell me, we're going to listen to certain things and see if it can be done better, whether that's, you know, the accuracy of the vocal, the quality, or maybe the, the character of it or the, um, the, the, the enunciation or, or something technical, right? How can we improve this and make this absolutely perfect before it gets sent off to mastering, right? The final mixing and all that. So the first thing you got to do is ac- ask yourself, self, singer self, can I do this live? Okay, because uh, let's face it, let's face it. You can get into the studio and you can comp a a word at a time, a sentence at a time, a verse at a time, a chorus at a time, and go back and just repair this thing and make it absolutely glorious. But you'd better be able to pull that thing off live or, or at least something that resembles it pretty much, right? Or you're going to be screwed. You're going to have this hit single come out. You're going to sound like a vocal god and then get on stage and be struggling and not be able to pull it off, okay? That's if you go too far in the studio and comping, for those of you that don't know what that means, is just where you just sing a little piece, you take a break, you come back, they punch you in, and then you sing another line, or you'll do several, several takes of the um, entire song, and the producer, the engineer will... 
um, slice and dice and cut and paste and come up with the perfect vocal take that's worthy of being printed and being the final uh, track that gets released, okay? So you go through the process of doing that and it sounds absolutely amazing. And then um, in my experience, after doing that, then um, your best bet is to actually go ahead and create a natural double track of that perfect comp track. If you do that, it'll sound better than any software doubling or doubling software that you'll ever find. A natural, a naturally recorded double will always sound better. Okay. And it, um, once you go through that process of doing all these takes and getting that perfect um, lead vocal, you get to know the song inside and out a lot better than you'd think, right? Every little nuance of that. And then of course, when you, if, if you're the kind of person like me that wants to actually sing something as close as humanly possible to what you're hearing on the recording, then you want to get to know that thing as closely as possible and practice it that way. Okay. So don't shoot yourself in the foot and <laughs> put something together that you can't pull off live or come close to live because chances are that'll be the song that just gets discovered, goes viral, becomes number one, right? Okay. Now the next thing I want to talk about is um, with the live singing versus the studio singing is the enunciation. Okay. In the studio, you may be working with a producer and they want you to pronounce something crystal clear with all the plosives and all the S's and T's and F's and all the things that in your training, <laughs> if you're working with a good coach, or at least I know um, in the classical training that I've had, um, in a portion of HVT, which is hybrid vocal technique, which, which is what I use and what I teach. The classical side of this, I learned uh, what we call the classical breath stop or the breath stop technique. And that's basically where, um, if I gave you a visualization of this, it'd be like going under, taking a, a deep breath, going underwater and then singing with no bubbles. Okay. I remember a coach actually telling me that and I told him well, that's impossible. And he said, well, maybe so but what would that feel like? And how would you be able to do that and not sound constricted, strained, or odd? How close could you get to that result, right? And the whole reason for that is so you can maintain the breath longer, which is directly tied into the expansion of your rib cage and um, your diaphragm dropping, everything being in uh, position, and you being able to support for a lot longer and not be shooting the breath out, wasting the breath, losing the support, and then all the tensions creeping in. Okay. So the enunciation you might do while you're comping a track will probably in most cases, if you sing difficult stuff like me, myself, I have a lot of experience singing um, power metal and classic rock and uh, classic heavy metal. And especially in the power metal and extreme power metal, <laughs> sometimes I wonder if the guitar players write all the lyrics because there's so many lyrics, it looks like you're reading a novel, right? And you gotta be able to sing that all and be able to somehow find a, a breath during all these blast beats and <laughs> extremely fast guitar riffs, right? So you're having to utilize a lot of um, airflow management, okay? Whereas in the studio, you could sing something crystal clear, pronounce every little plosive and percussive and everything to the producers until his heart is content, right? But then when you get up there and you sing live, that's not going to be the only song in most cases. You might have an hour to sing, an hour and a half, maybe two hours, maybe three sets of 45 minutes, who knows? So there's going to be a difference in the way you enunciate, pronounce things and, and, uh, and take those breaks between, you know, takes is a lot different studio singing versus live singing, right? Okay. So the clarity, the plosives, the clarity and the plosives versus stamina and endurance. All right. So a, a good example of this is uh, breathing exercises, like the, the breathing exercises that I use and that I teach, um, I inherited from my 
main coach and mentor, Al Cohen, and he was trained by the late maestro David Kyle. Okay, so they, they're the exact same breathing exercises that Jeff Tate from Queensryche used, Ann Wilson from Hart, Lane Staley from Allison Chains, Chris Cornell, yada yada, so on and so forth. A lot of great singers use these really old classical breathing uh, diaphragmatic strengthening coordinating exercises. We we'll do them every day, right? Now, part of those exercises is to take a deep breath and clearly and crystal clear enunciate counting. So you take a deep breath and you try to make this as clear as possible, okay, which is going to waste breath. While at the same time, on the other side of the coin, you're trying to re, uh, reserve the breath. So you're taking a breath. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and trying to resonate and, and make it crystal clear while not allowing the rib cage to collapse. Okay, so it's fighting you, it's fighting you the whole time. Now, when we train, of course, we modify consonants and do all kinds of, um, of live tricks um, <laughs> in our training and teach you all about this stuff in, um, in my flagship course, or if you were studying with me uh, privately, I would teach all this stuff. But I actually have a, uh, a, a mini course available. I just released it recently. It's called The Secrets of Live Singing. And there's links in the description box if you wanna check that out. And I talk all about everything under the sun with live singing and versus studio singing and some crazy stuff you'd probably never heard of. And if you had, you'd probably laugh at the things that happened to me. So I want to talk a little bit about that, okay? That's some horror stories, some real horror stories out there, okay? Um, and that's one of the reasons why I created this little mini course. It's actually not a, um, I mean, there is a little bit of advanced singing in there, but it's not really a training course, more, uh, it's more of a um, experience, experiences, things to look out for, um, because it's for all levels of experience from the beginning karaoke singer all the way to the arena professional singer, live um, situations and, and, and how, to, how to get results with your sound check better, a more optimized sound check, and just all kinds of things going on in that course. So I do invite you to check that out, okay? So let me give you an example, all right? Now, I remember uh, like I, I, in, in that course, I talk about uh, getting pretty much a stage walkthrough. It's like you're <laughs> walking through a house if you're you know, trying to buy a house or you're looking at apartments and stuff and you're going with a realtor and you're checking things out. I suggest that people do this on every single stage they plan on performing on or that they are going to perform on when you're setting up, after you get set up, after you do the sound check, before and after. You're walking around, you got your arms, uh, you know, out to your sides and you got kind of like a circular distance and see, because some stages are smaller than others, right? So you're trying to see whether you're going to run into the bassist or the guitarists or the keyboards or whatever, where you're going to put your water, right? Do you have floor wedges? Do you have in-ears? Can you see the sound man? Do you have uh, focal points if you suffer from stage fright? Do you have focus points? What's going on there? and then check the floor out, right? Um, the reason I started doing this, one, I almost fell off the stage one time, okay? I, I'm a firm believer in wireless gear from now on, <laughs> okay? Um, but once I, um, I would always, I've always had the habit of keeping my water, you know, my hydration, all my water, um, either on, usually right in front of the drum riser. Okay, because that way, you know, the mic is up on the stand and, you know, while there's a solo going on or whatever and you need to, you know, wet your whistle, go back there and get a drink, I could have my back turned to the audience, you know, and, and get a drink so they don't just see me just chugging water right in front of them. All right, so I'd always put that right in front of the drum riser. Well, one time I was playing a show, is at a festival, and I have never seen this before, but they had actually built in a fog machine to where they had the, the hose barely coming out of the drum riser, okay? So I didn't know that it was there, all right? Usually I'll, you know, now I look for stuff like that, but before I wouldn't even think about it, you know, things would just kind of 
you know, fog would come out of nowhere. And I used, I would even kind of tell a little white lie and just tell, you know, the, the venue, hey, look, I, I'm allergic to the smoke. Because that smoke that is in the fog machine, it is, it is the coolest looking effect, but it is absolutely the worst thing for your voice. Other than bad technique and, and talking in loud environments, like over speaking. Okay, that stuff's terrible. So back to my story, I go and I get a drink of water. Now, I'm holding a bottle of water in front of me right now, okay? Now, when you get a drink of water, this, I'll get right up on my microphone so you can hear this. So you take a, a drink, right? And usually you do that kind of like the right after, right? It's an exhale. What do you do right after you exhale? You inhale. That's nature, right? Well, it just so happens I went to get a drink right during um, a guitar solo or, or, or a actually like an instrumental break. There was a couple measures in, be in between this thing and I needed a drink of water. So I go down there, I pick up my water, I get my drink. And then as soon as I go to inhale, the fog machine just shoots fog right into my face. It goes right down my throat and I coughed like crazy. I mean, it was like, it was like, you know, the, the van from, uh, Cheech and Chong or something or for or fast times at Ridgemont high. It was just like, I mean, smoke everywhere. Right. So I will never forget that as long as I live. I mean, it was horrible. I mean, as soon as I went to inhale fog, just part of my hair, man, you know? So that's one funny thing that's happened. I've, you know, it's, it sometimes it's funny when you rewatch stuff after you know people are okay. You know, I've seen guys fall off stage. I've seen singers trip over microphone cables. I've seen, um, you know, singers hold a mic stand trying to be cool and then go and turn and knock a keyboard over or a computer over from the keyboard's uh, station. I've seen all kinds of stuff happen, right? <laughs> I mean, there was even one time where you know, it was like an instrumental break and I had a wireless and took it with me. And the first thing, of course, from drinking tons of water that day, first thing you do is go to the restroom. And I had that wireless in my back pocket, a Shure SM58 wireless. Thank goodness it was turned off. <laughs> okay. As I used the restroom. So things like that can happen. So there's, there's a ton of stuff like that in there. Um, just old horror stories and um, a lot of advice for all kinds of different things. So I do suggest you check it out. Okay. So now, um, we go back to the, um, the live versus studio. We have headphones, we have in-ears, we have floor wedges, you know, we have monitoring. We need to be able to hear ourselves and that's all fine and dandy in the studio. You're in the, the most purest neutral environment, the perfect environment for you to track your best vocals. You should be able to hear yourself clearly. There's no crowd. There's no nothing. And, and <laughs> you can actually dial in, um, a mix or the engineer can dial in a mix in your headphones and in ears that actually makes sense instead of you just, you know, your band being just wide open and then the crowd and everything else, people shooting pool, everything going on. And you are just doing everything you can to hear yourself. That's something that happens, right? So headphones are wonderful in ears. When you're live, some people, most people love them. I kind of had a love hate relationship with in ears. Um, I feel kind of claustrophobic, like, you know, like Darth Vader underwater or something. And so I always like to have one in my dominant ear and one out and then use a floor wedge. That was always my, my go-to for the best of both worlds. So I could kind of hear up, up close and personal. And then also the room kind of like what everybody else is hearing. And that might be a little OCD, but that's just how I am. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, hearing is a big deal, a big deal. It would actually pay dividends to, um, have somebody actually record, which most people do nowadays on your best and worst days, <laughs> everyone will be out there, uh, preferring to actually record the show with their phone instead of watching it and, and enjoying it, you know, and I get it. They want to save it for later, but I would suggest you uh, have somebody do that during your sound check. 
see what it actually sounds like, you know, how well can you actually hear yourself, you know, think about it. Okay, and then um, another thing that's uh, kind of funny, the differences in um, the studio in that perfect environment, you got the producer and the engineer, right? And you got people there, you know, you're there trying to get your very best vocal out of you. And, and they'll take all the time in the world to do that and make sure it's perfect because they're going to put their name in there, right? And then um, sometimes live, sometimes you have the best crew ever. I don't want to... Uh, give any road crew, you know, <laughs> a bad name by saying this at all, but sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes you have the invisible sound man or the unreliable borrowed sound man from the opening band or something. Things happen. People get sick. They don't show. They get lost. I mean, all kinds of stuff happens, right? So, you know, you have to take into account a lot of things, and and uh, sometimes you have to uh, learn a little bit about sound and and um, making sure you do get that optimum monitoring going, no matter what it takes. You know, okay. So think about it. Uh, even in band practice, I know. I mean, I've been playing since since the mid late '80s, playing in bands, and it's always been the the battle or the war for volume supremacy between me, the, the guitar players, and the drummer. The bass player just kind of is like, yeah, whatever, you know, because that frequency will go through. It's, it's different. But um, the guitarists, the guitarists, they just, you know, I can't hear myself. I can't hear myself. And I'm like, how do you think I feel? Who do you think it hurts worse? You know, uh, the guitarist always wants to be the loudest person on earth. But if we can't hear ourselves, it won't matter how good they play, the performance will suffer, the band's name will suffer, and, and you as a vocalist will suffer. So you gotta you gotta have that talk with them, you know. Um, another <laughs> one more or two more one well I'll put this into one more uh, horror story before I before I wrap this uh, this episode up is um, I remember one time I was playing in Norway and uh, <laughs> I went to get, I just said, you know, I just want water. You know, there's, a lot of people have all these different requirements. They want this, that, and the other, you know, I want honey and it's got to be from the fields of blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, just give me some room temp water. That's all I want. Just give me some water. You know, that's all I want. And um, I remember one time I uh, went to get the water, you know, you know, take the drink of it and for whatever reason, they put like a seltzer water in there. And I went to take a drink of that and just spit it right out. <laughs> it was like, you know, just like, like it was toxic or something. It just wasn't what I was used to. And, um, you know, everybody over there drinking that. And I was like, man, what is this? And then um, uh, finally, this happened in the studio. Um, I had had a tip from another singer, friend of mine. And he used to swear by it. He's a classical singer. And um, he used to actually gargle with olive oil. He would gargle with sound, you know, and do that with, with olive oil. And so I was recording, um, let's see, we were tracking the, let's see, the Three album in my band, The Sacrificed. And um, I was talking to my drummer uh, in between uh, track and vocals and stuff, and um, I had it in there, and I think I, I, we might have been rehearsing. I, I can't remember. I know we had tracked vocals, and I had, I had done that um, to try to get a little, you know, take the advice, you know, and try it for myself, see what would happen. And it was like, eh, I think it might have been the placebo effect. I don't know. But, um, but I remember talking to my drummer and then reaching for my water just to get a drink and grabbing that olive oil by accident and taking a big old drink of it. <laughs> It was horrible. It was horrible in a lot of different ways. Anyway, that about does it for this episode, okay, of the Visual Vocalist Podcast. If you'd like to check out my mini course, The Secrets of Live Singing, or learn more about me and hybrid vocal technique, then click the link below and head over to hybridvocaltechnique.com and explore all of the vocal training options made available to you, such as HVT vocal training programs, private one-on-one -on -one online coaching with me, or you could become a VIP member and get streaming access to the entire HVT vocal training library. Also, 
community, Q&A live streams, giveaways, legacy content for my teacher, and of course, discounted private lessons. So the choice is yours. Please make it today and let's sing. I'll see you next time.